Oh, hands are all tingly. It feels a little strange. I hit the live button. Man, it's been so long. John, how are you? Oh, Jeff, I am fantastic. It's so good to see you again. I, me too. Uh, I knew that you would be interested in this, and I'm so glad I reached out, and we've sort of have found another on top of our many other mm -hmm. interests that cross over with each other, um, found another you know common passion in, in AI here. So thanks for inviting me, and, and thanks for, for putting me on this platform with DevNet. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, I did. I'm so glad you said yes. And I'm glad you reached out to me and showed me all the, the cool hotness. But I'm going to bury the lead a little bit because everyone who's watching, thank you so much for being here. I see Kat out there, Marie, really appreciate you both. Anybody else who's here, jump in the chat. Uh, the question I'd put to everybody is, um, what are you excited about or scared about with AI? I'm, I'm super curious. I want to bear, I'm going to leave that alone. But you put out whatever you want, safe space, feel your feels. It's totally okay. There's a lot going on and a lot is changing almost every single day, if not multiple times in the same day. And we're going to get into some of that. But to kick things off, John and I are here today to talk about, you know, we put this little clickbaity title that said, you know, revolutionize network automation with AI. And while it's a little clickbaity, I think it's really, really true. So some background here. About two weeks ago, my wife and I were at a conference in San Diego. And it was about a lot of different topics, including content. But one of the big topics was around AI and learning a lot about what it can do, what it is doing, et cetera. And for me, at least, it got me to a place of realizing that the more the rest of us, the more the wide world can embrace the augmentation that AIs provide to us as humans, the more that we can do, the more successful we can be at things that we already do. Now, I know there's lots of people have their own feelings and some of those feelings are problematic, all of that's valid 100%. So what we're here to talk about today is one corner of this world of, you know, um, AGI or conversational, so AGI being artificial general intelligence, or in this case, we're just going to talk about conversational type API, AIs like ChatGPT, but there's a multitude of them out there. Jasper.ai is another really big one. Um, we're going to talk a lot about ChatGPT because it's the one that's highly accessible with no cost to everybody out there. Um, and to do that, John has volunteered to be on and do a stream and really just talk about not only AI in general, but really get into some weeds about this super rad project he's been working on that, at least from my point of view, will show, I hope everybody here, how it's going to change what we do as network, network operators, network engineers, and how we automate networks, how we make those networks do things for us. Um, so I'm going to stop there. John, awesome to have you here buddy for everyone who's watching the stream and who doesn't know you yet you might give it a little bit of like a kind of wax poetic about who you are sure so um john capabianco i live just outside of ottawa ontario canada i live actually live on the quebec side of the river in a little village called val de Mont. and um, i finally have high speed internet out here thank you for all your support over the years on dsl but i um i joined cisco a year ago um, in a role with the cisco training boot camps team and we do automation boot camps and product boot camps and we have a landing page. If you're curious about the boot camps, we can take that offline. Um, absolutely loved my first year at Cisco. Cisco Live and Cisco Live and Mia in Amsterdam and meeting wonderful people like you and really collaborating. Mm -hmm. um, in my free time, and people know this maybe through my Twitter or my LinkedIn and stuff, I'm constantly just trying to write code and have fun with Python and, and network automation in general. And I've picked up a lot of tools along the way. And then I got thinking just a few weekends ago, this is only about three weeks old, how could I take advantage of this new AI capability? And um, and one thing I want to highlight to people is, yes, there is a GUI that you type in, and you've probably done that or played with that. But did you know there is an API and a Python SDK that is ready with OpenAI? So we can integrate it with our Python code and our scripts. And in my case, what I started with was PyETS jobs. And here's my thinking, Jeff, because we have this capability, it's a simple API call. When a test fails, let's just pick one, interface discards fails. Could I then send questions to the AI with that context of, I have input discards on an interface, and then we start talking about prompt engineering and the questions and answers. Mm -hmm. And that's where I really started with this. <clears throat> and it was remarkable. It, it really opened my eyes. It was like, wow, what a a watershed moment for me to see this because the answers were good. It was fast. I could build it into my code and my logic. So that's sort of where I started. And now I have a bunch of user stories. 
you know, you, success builds on success and ideas spawn ideas. So I have a bunch of user stories that I'm hoping to, sh to share today. Eventually, we can talk a little bit more. But um, that's sort of the genesis of, of, of what I wanted to do was actually take it and, and think of it this way. We have WebEx APIs, Google APIs, Twilio APIs, Azure APIs, uh, Cisco APIs, all these different APIs. This mm -hmm. is just another new API that's been available to us. And it works like most other APIs. And for network automation, very specifically, could I take something like a failed test, the state of an interface, the running config of a device, um, right? There's possibilities are endless, and I'll show you some use cases, mm -hmm. but get AI's help. Like you said, the word augmentation, and that's the key here. Could yeah. I augment my own <clears throat> capabilities with this tool to help give me at least its best guess, its best answer? Exactly. And in most cases, it's been high fidelity answers that would actually be helpful. So in my current role, you know, this isn't maybe as applicable, but I try to put my hat on of when I, my previous role of a senior architect in a very large public sector organization running an enterprise network, a data center, a WAN, wireless security, identity services, you name it, all these massive services with a huge team of operators. And we just try to keep scaling with more and more people to throw people at the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So I think in those terms, if I was doing that job and this tool was available to me in that job a year ago, how would I use it mm -hmm. to help my team and my operations and overall the quality and the stability and the security and all those great things about the production network? Could I get insights from AI that maybe a human might miss or might not might misinterpret? So that's been my journey, Jeff. What about... Have you done anything specifically like that that's caught that really like yeah. lit your fire with this tool? First off, before I say that, I will say that um, two things. One, John McCrate, who's uh, McCrate, uh, John, I hope that's how I'm, you pronounce your last name. Um, maybe it's McCrate, I'm not sure. Um, your comment a second ago, I, I love that you put that in there. Um, I am, Ivan, I'm happy you put yours in there too. John, I specifically like this because you're calling out exactly what I believe. Uh, AI is fantastic at doing so. And now I'll kind of answer your question, John, which is, and you leaned into that word I had mentioned earlier, augmentation. So anybody who knows me, if you can't tell in my background, I'm a massive Star Wars fan, massive. Matter of fact, one of these days, I'm going to make a little box to go over my heater air conditioning unit here to make it my little R2-D2 droid in the shed. Um, but droids are how I think about what AI is. And it's the thing that made it all this click for me recently was if you're a Star Wars geek like I am, if you've watched any Star Wars, all these people have droids. Droids have a finite data set in them, but it's a massive data set. And they can answer just about any question you might have or give you guidance on almost anything you might want from that data set. They can always download more data, but it's a say it's a, like a, a preset or it's a finite amount of data. And you can ask them questions and they will give you responses. And then the human or the sentient being in this case, um, not to be cinephobic, it still has to take that information and do something actionable with it. The droid, well, droids could fly a ship, what have you. It really needs the data coming from the one augmenting the, the being to do something intelligent. And that's how I think of AI and where I think, to John McCrate's point here, where I think AIs can really be immensely powerful for network engineers and people who want to do some form of automation in their infrastructure, whatever that looks like, um, because it takes the repetitive stuff that computers are really, really good at doing, gives it even more insight and lets it handle some of those things for you. You still have to give it what you want it to do. It's not going to, it's not, it's not actual intelligence. There's no feeling, there's no emotion here. It's just going to respond to a thing that you provided it. It'll give you the, the likely next set of words that would match that. So you have to guide it. So one doesn't work without the other, but, or yet, in my opinion, anyone who's not willing to sort of at least entertain the idea that this, this augmentation can really value, uh, create value for you in what you do every day. Um, I think, I think you're doing yourself a disservice and I'll explain, I'll tell you the places I'm, this has really been helping me is, um, I am not a great copywriter, meaning write, actually writing things I'm really terrible at. I can dictate. I can sit here and talk and like just come up with stuff off the top of my head and feel very comfortable with it. But if you said, Jeff, that was all great. You should go write that down. Cool. And then I would sit down and completely draw a blank and have no idea what to write. So what what AI, what chat GPT specifically has helped me with, and my wife uses jasper.ai as well. So we kind of 
work them in conjunction with each other is I can feed it an idea and a, a prompt with context about what, how I want it to think about itself. Here's what I want to write something about. Here's all the technical things I can think of in my head. Here's the tone I want it to use. Write me a 300 word blog post or something. And it comes back with that. Now, am I gonna use it the way it came back? No, not at all. But it gave me motivation to go, cool, I don't talk like this, but now I know a better idea of what I want to actually write and I can go break it apart and move things around or delete it and start over. But it got me to a place that I wasn't at before. And to me, that is super valuable. Now I'll add something because I was channeling you a little bit in San Diego a couple of weeks ago when I was at the conference and learning these things, I'd come out of an AI session, wife and I would sit down. She's like, here's what you're going to go do. And so I did it. And I, there's a presentation I've given a few times about work-life rhythm. And I decided from some feedback I got during the last presentation there, some people was like, oh, I'd love it to have more technical, some technical component, not meant to be a technical presentation. I'm like, you know what? Challenge accepted. So I sat down and said, what would be really useful? And I said, chat GPT, tell me what would be useful in this presentation, you know, with this topic, to add that would be technical. And it came back saying, well, an automated time tracker tool, an automated reminder tool, and gave, gave me like five different tools that would be really useful. I'm like, you know what? Great. Go build me that tool. And it did. And so, so far of the five, I've had ChatGPT build me three of these tools in Python. They're pretty straightforward. I've tested two of them and they work exactly the way the instructions came back from ChatGPT saying they would work. And to me, what's awesome about that is not that it made a tool. It's that it just saved me having to think about how would I go through and learn all the things necessary to do this when really that's not the story that I'm trying to tell in the presentation. The story I'm trying to tell is about how do you let, use these tools, these augmentations to do the, be able to then empower you to do the things you really want to do. And if I can have an, an augmentation like an AI save me time to make this thing so I can show that, make that relevant in the story I'm telling someone else. To me, that's just all like, that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish here is, is doing that. So yeah, I was, I was actually thinking, Chun's gonna be so proud of me. <laughs> so I was asking it to go, I'm like, write me some Python code and tell me the instructions on how to do it. And it said, sure. And here's all the pen dependencies you're going to need to satisfy first. And I'm like, this is brilliant. That is just awesome. Yeah. So, um, let me, let me show you something pretty quickly. And, and this it. is, um, a do real it. high level one. So what I thought was, what if I could get the show run off a device? and ask it some simple questions. One, is it okay? Does this configuration look okay? And two, and this one I think is gonna really excite some people, a lot of people, because of the importance of security. Is this secure? So take a running config and give an off of some device and ask it two simple prompts. So let me share the screen. And I haven't set this up yet, so we're gonna do this together in a second. And um, is it sharing? Does everyone see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Maybe oh, hold on one second. Of... That's not, that's on me. Sorry. That's I'm on the producer. Checking. No, no, I'm checking my my there side screen. Now there we, can we see go. It. Okay, wonderful. See. Okay, so um, I don't want to get too technical, but I built a Django framework around some code, some Python code, PyTS scripts primarily, and that's what we're going to be using here. And I have some buttons, and it's pretty fun. So in our admin panel, what we're going to do is go to configuration prompts, and what we're going to do is say. You are a Cisco configuration validator. Please analyze the following Cisco running configuration and tell me if it is okay. And stamp that today and now. And let's write the follow up question. You are a Cisco security analyzer please analyze the following running configuration and tell me if it is secure today now okay so now we're going to go into our on-demand center and we're going to do configuration state analysis and in the background when i click the button the code kicks off in just a second here. And it does some things. It gets the running config and then it asks ChatGPT with those prompts. And what we're gonna do is just wait for the spinner to come back to say it's complete. Now we can view the results when it's done with a little click of a button, or we could even go into our browse and let's see if some of those interfaces have come back. And that was configuration state. Okay, so it's, it's still working in the background.
and I'm not sure if it's hung up or if, uh, so there's the running config I've asked it. It might be waiting for the chat GPT to come back with an answer. So obviously, as, as it's working through, for anybody who's watching right now, John or Sean or anybody else, obviously, this is one of the challenges with the current iteration of ChatGPT, as one example, is that it isn't always available because lots and lots and lots of people want to use it. So sometimes the response times don't quite work the way that you anticipate. But the good news about that is this stuff is changing almost every other day. Like it's it's being added. I mean, they only just recently added the subscriptions to chat GPT so you can access GPT-4, which does take longer, but you get more high fidelity responses with it, which I, I'm using myself now too. Um, but the fact that you were even able to make those calls to begin with, John, is pretty cool. Okay, it's um, it's answering now, I apologize. Am I still sharing my screen? Nope, it dropped the share, but you can bring it back up. I apologize, it did, it was the um, API just sort it's okay. of uh, no tied up See, there. this is this is why I love doing live things like this, especially when it comes to code, because, for everyone watching, what you what people are going to see is that like you're going to have to deal with these problems. No matter what you're working with, you're going to have to deal with these things. Sometimes <laughs> the, fly. the demo gods are not always good to us, so right. sometimes so, you just have to do it. So it asked the first question, and we can actually refresh this. And it gave us kind of a wishy-washy answer. So what I record is the host name of the device, the running config that we fed it, and then our prompt, or persona, excuse me, your Cisco configuration validator. Please analyze it. Is it okay? And then it says... The configuration appears to be valid syntax wise. It's difficult to fully validate without other knowledge of the topology requirements. So kind of an agnostic answer. Let me refresh this or explain it like I'm, or is it secure yet might be still running. And um, again, it's it does appear to be, um, <laughs> the API is, is very slow, but we did get the first answer. So uh, maybe we picked a bad time to do a demo in the middle of the day with the chat GPT 3.5 because it's busy. But that's that's sort of the idea. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I mean, if I get it, if if I get the answer to the next question. But um, let's you know, let's talk about the, the maybe the implications of the, the ramifications of that. We actually have. Well, actually, so actually, pause for one yeah. second. Well, before you get into that, because I, I want you to do that. Let's let's take a quick step back, and I think it'd be really interesting for and Sean Dahlberg chimed in a second ago. Yes, Devi. Debbie is here in my my shed studio. Debbie's on John's wall, hanging out there on John's wall. Debbie's always everywhere. Um, let's take a step back for you. Um, what if there was if there was one thing? Maybe there just wasn't one. But if there was one thing that sort of triggered you to say, "I want to try," not just doing this with ChatGPT because you were you're always you're, you've been working on PyATS stuff for a while. You helped co co-author a book. Like you've been doing a lot with that pro that product. When it comes to leveraging ChatGPT as an example with PyATS for this project, what what sort of motivated or inspired you to even go down this path? <laughs> and it's funny. It's a good question. I don't I don't always know where these sparks of inspiration come from. Um, I really I found a repeatable sort of pattern, and you know it builds on something like Blender or Google Text to Speech or some even Django itself, you know, wrapping a framework around PyTS with Django. I like to just explore um, someone in the community and they'll know who they are. I don't want to call them out by name, but they call me a cave diver. And I always seem to be diving in caves and exploring and looking for new things and exploring the latest thing. And, and some caves come up empty. You know, there's nothing in them. It's a dead end. It's been a waste of a dive. But this one, I feel like there's been a treasure chest of gold at the bottom of this particular chat GPT cave because everything has worked out so well. Now, I know the demo is a little slow because the, uh, um, you know, I'm getting some API call errors because of the chat GPT, but, but that's okay. Uh, I'm glad at least we did get the one configuration analysis and I'll try this again in the background while we're waiting. Um, but in terms of what inspires me, you mentioned droids. I think about my first interaction with, with something digital when I was very small and very young, and it was a speak and spell. I don't know if people today probably have no idea what this is. It's a small little child's toy that you could type in words or letters and hit speak, and it would read back those words. Now, it might seem quaint in 2023, but in 1983, that was pretty remarkable. And if you look at the history of this technology, it was actually the first human voice synthesizer was in this toy. So that's sort of what I'm like, I can type in something, hit a button, and it actually speaks back to me. In our case today, 
I can ask it a question and get back some answer. Now, for anyone saying, oh, what if you get a bad answer? Oh, what if it hallucinates? Oh, what if, you know, a human could still do it better today. It's like six months old, five months old. Imagine this in a year, five years, 10 years. Imagine the scale Moore's law applied to this chat GPT or this AI, right? At some point, I believe mathematically, it will cross a threshold of being better than humans at particular tasks, like generating configs based on requirements and even applying configs based on requirements. But that's just that's just my excitement. Um, I think you're totally right. Um, something I learned about you know when ChatGPT was announced back in last November, it's the data set that it was 3.5, the legacy 3.5 is working off of was a two year old technology. Like it had already been being researched by OpenAI open for two years. So what we're getting today is just the most, like you said, the most current iteration of what that looks like. But OpenAI is this one foundation, this one, well, used to be nonprofit, now, you know, for profit. ChatGPT is one iteration of a conversational type AI. But I mentioned Jasper.ai. There are, there are thousands now. Three months ago, there were hundreds. Now there are literally thousands of companies leveraging these AI backends and LLMs, large language models to do this type of stuff. It is advancing so fast that to your point, John, I don't even know if it'll be six months. I mean, it probably will be a couple of months as, and we will see, we will see interactions improve dramatically in some cases. So dramatically, it probably will scare people even more. I would imagine, but the reality is it's still not, it's not true intelligence. It just gets better and better at predicting what it thinks you might want. I, it's your kind of your rear um, through line here is it's all about the augmentation. It's the, the better it can get at doing that augment augmented based work that you need it to do. So you can make an intelligent decision, the better off we all are going to be, I think. Right. I, I completely agree. Um, and I, it, unfortunately it does appear that there are some issues right now with the chat GPT, at least the API, but um, let me, let me try, let me just try something else. And um, even if it doesn't work, you know, I, I'm going to ask the audience maybe to to just maybe <laughs> imagine or pretend <laughs> it works. It did work. It, this has been working all day, I all morning, all night. Jeff, see it. People have seen it. Unfortunately, the API seems to be overwhelmed. But let me let me show you something else. It, actually, maybe before I share the screen, um, I think a lot of people, and I hate to maybe fuel this fire, but they sort of conflate network automation with configuration management or maybe even AI with configuration management. We're gonna generate and push configs with AI. I think that is a pillar of this and I'm gonna show that in a second, but there is much more and, I, and, and we can do interface state analysis. We can do all kinds of great things, but let me just show you that example of maybe a configuration management. And so if I go into my database, what I've done here is set up a prompt that says you're a Cisco configuration generator. Now pay attention here. This is the human language. Generate the configuration for an iOS XE NTP server with this IP address. Now I've had to tag on respond with code only and no notes and no replace because all I want is the config. So now let's try this. I hope the API is answering and we can watch the logs as this runs. Now it's at the chat GPT part right now. It's asking the question. So if this, you know, if this hangs up on us, we might just have to give it time for the GPT to answer. But um, uh, so what the idea is, is to get the current running config, generate some config from chat GPT, use PyETS to apply it, and then, um, give a differential and write the, the results to mm -hmm. the database. So let me ask you something. Well, that's, well, we're kind of waiting for the back end, yeah. uh, GPT, the back end of that platform to respond. Um, what, so in your mind, since you're, what you are doing is literally not including, in this case, we're usually referencing iOS XE commands. It could be really anything, but let's just, we'll stick with this. In the case of iOS XE, what, in your mind, what is the value of abstracting away the specific technical knowledge necessary in this one case of putting those commands directly into a repository that says, this is what you're going to do if this thing happens. And instead asking the AI to do it for you, well, to you, what value is that bringing to an operator by having this? Well, I think that um, it, it semi democratizes the, the whole experience of being, 
you know, involved in generating configurations or writing configurations. And very similar to your story about um, you may not use it 100% or what the, what the raw answer was. You may use it as a starting point. I think we can use this as a starting point quite a bit to get us going with configuration management. Um, but for routine things, and if it actually has some some good answers that we can use and it's reliable to a degree and repeatable to a degree, why not, is that not maybe the, the ultimate goal for intent-based configuration management where it actually comes from our human-driven intent in human language, right? I'd like a NAT on this interface, on that interface. I'd like a static route, right? We're not, we don't, it, it sort of democratizes the experience of configuration management, <clears throat> but it also lets people you know, get rid of the, maybe some of the mundane, some of the routine, some of the, the more tedious aspects of their job. Um, you know, it's fascinating. I don't mean to cut you off, but it's fascinating that you mention it that way, because for a number of years now in the technical, in the IT universe that we kind of float around, the idea of intent-based networking has existed um, for a long time. Like we, it's something we've been talking about various companies, including Cisco have dabbled in and continue to dabble in some form of technology that will bring intent based networking into the real world and make it actually a real thing. And not that any of those have failed or not succeeded varying levels of success based on what your goals are, but putting all of those vendor type solutions aside for just a moment, the idea that what you just described almost gets us even closer to this idea of an intent-based network where you are literally asking something, provide me something. I, I, this is what I want to have done. Something is going to come back to you and say off of hopefully, you know, eventually vendors will be able to work on this a little bit more. I'm sure Cisco is too. Um, be able to say like, here's a response based off of a trusted source. That's only learned off of this data set. Here's exactly what you are looking for. And it saves you the chance because most people are going to just Google something developers do it all day long. So why not just go to a trusted source that's just going to give you the answer you were looking for rather than 10 different answers you have got to sort through. This thing can just tell you what you need and the intent of what you were trying to get done, you can shorten that time up substantially, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I completely agree with what you're saying, Jeff. And uh, by the way, I just checked platform.openai.com and it's down. They're re receiving too many requests right now. Ah, so there you go. Hey, look <laughs> at the timing, right? Of course, we set this all up and the demo is ready to go and we're up late, ready to make sure things are good. And of course, the API is down. So maybe a lesson learned here is that you can't maybe rely on this API 100% just yet, or you need an enterprise key or something for the service. But um, back to, I guess, the point. Something like, is it secure? So there's two points maybe I want to make. One is around the prompt engineering. Is it secure? The answers I was getting back were wonderful. One of them would say, um, it looks okay, and here's things you've implemented that make it secure, but here's what you've missed. And here's a list of bullet points of things you want to actually <clears throat> apply to make it more secure. Mm -hmm. Now at scale with hundreds or thousands of devices, right? Security audits take time, they're expensive, it requires a lot of mm -hmm. right, uh, heavy um, human capabilities are required to do big security audits across every running config in an entire network. Well, now you just set up a batch job that pulls every running config against the AI and gives you nice security reports per device save them out to files or put them in a database or something, actionable information, actionable intelligence. The next one I really like, and I wish I could show this today, maybe the API will come back in time, but is explain it like I'm five. So anyone playing with this, explain it like I'm five has been a one, and it sounds funny and you can laugh, but it's been a wonderful question to ask about technical things, particularly like network related. Right? What is an interface discard? Explain it like I'm five. What is an interface CRC error? What is a static route? Where what, you know, based on your analysis of this configuration, explain it to me like I'm five, what I'm trying to achieve with this configuration, right? So, um, did it come back maybe? Let me try this again. And while you're thinking about that, um, <clears throat> Boyard, um, made a comment there we go it's like automated intent-based networking i love that i love that way of describing it because i think that almost takes that almost takes the idea of just the intent to a whole new definition it's you know you see it's funny because you boy you can you combine the words automated intent 
and it almost just becomes just intent. What I intended to happen was this thing. And then it went and automatically happened for me, which is almost what we all kind of were thinking about to begin with, which is a really cool idea. Um, well, and right now today we, we try to express intent as YAML because it's as close to human and language as we can get is a simple structured YAML file. That's what most intent driven automation mm -hmm. Ansible or PyTS or whatever, right? It comes from like a YAML structured file. Well, now we've got a step further and made it a human sentence that anybody could understand at any level of, uh, of the organization. Right? Yeah. So there's actually one of the comments that just came up while you're still pulling that up is I'm going to bring this up from John and it's it. I, we all laugh because it's a funny thing to think about, but here's John, I'll give you John crate. I will, I'll give you some, uh, uh, something that was said to me or said to an audience at a conference I was at uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the, what the person said was primarily talking to marketers, but what the person said was to a, the common question that everybody was asking. And that's, this is not quite what you're saying here, but the, these folks were all saying, oh my gosh, with as simple as this stuff is, are marketers or copywriters going to be out of a job? And the person said, no, absolutely not. What you what will happen though, is anyone who doesn't adopt AI as an augmentation to the things that they do to speed it up and make it better and whatever else, those people will likely end up being, becoming irrelevant and struggle to find new jobs. Whereas people who do adopt these things and find ways to work it into what they're doing will just become more and more successful. So kind of taking the, the humor, unfortunately, I'm going to take the humor out because I'm just going to be a buzzkill for a minute. I'll take the humor out of what John Crate just said here, uh, McCray just said here a second ago. But I, I want to get to it that I don't think that even if uh, an LLM gets to the place and the data set it worked off of is able to predict, to your point, John, um, the state of the network along with generative examples and all that. I actually don't think that's a, I think that's a really good thing. It's something I've talked to a lot of people about when I've, when I used to talk to people who said like, well, I don't really want to automate. This is the very binary extreme view of it. I'm not going to automate stuff because I'm a CCIE and my value to the company is all that stuff that I do. It's like, if your value to the company is your finger ops, like how fast you can type commands at a keyboard, that doesn't make you very valuable. What makes you valuable is how you and your experience and all of these years can take all of this information dissemble it and then turn it into really good actions and solutions for the business that's what humans are amazing at the stuff that actually is being described when we say can we just merge the state of the network along with a generative example of what to do next if it wants to give it to us i don't necessarily want the ai to then go automatically input that content directly and without some sort of human checking it or some other controls in place but if it wants to produce those things based off of data sets it can do substantially faster and probably with a lot less error than i can do or another person can do heck yeah let it go do it so i can or you john or any of us can get sit back and say now where do i want to point that i'm at this company here's the problems we have where do i want to point this powerful technology to then solve for the next problem that could really advance the business forward so to me it actually turns out to be a really powerful tool um you got it like the gold google saying don't be evil <laughs> you can't don't be right. evil don't put it out there in a bad way become lex luther but the reality is i think it just it again becomes an even more powerful augmentation to the things we've always wanted to do but never really knew that we could do it without somehow manufacturing all these technologies that didn't exist we're starting to get that technology which i think is rad and john mccray i know you're trying to be funny and i i'm sorry for being like a total serious a serious nut about exactly what you said but i thought that might it was something i really wanted to chime in on well that's great i am um, i <clears throat> i'm i'm sorry i'm i'm a little distracted i think that's it's okay. maybe hobbling back into service now i'm just checking so well, that's okay you keep doing that um, i'll address some of these other comments because it's a good time to kind of take a yeah, break let's catch up um, and we're, uh, Wharton one put up a question saying, is ChatGPT made by Python or there other used, or there were uh, used various languages? So that's a really good question, Wharton. Um, it kind of gets down to the root of like, what are these, these AIs or what, where, rather than the AI, the language model, the LLM that was used by, that was built and trained by OpenAI, the organization that ChatGPT is a front end to get into. Um, I'm oversimplifying that a bit, but just go with me. Um, that LLNM was trained on a data set that was essentially the entire internet for a period of time. And so nearly every out like, um, openly available 
coding language, a programming language on the internet that you can find, ChatGPT can probably write that language for you. So for example, if you went there, not right now, because clearly the API is or the backend is having a little problem, but normally go there and tell it, hey, I'd like you to build me in this example, Python, build me a, build me a program written in Python that accomplishes this one task. It will go do it. But you could say the same thing in JavaScript and in Go or in React or whatever you wanted, and it would go do that too. Do you need to double check it? Yes, absolutely. The data set is relatively, it's a couple years old, so it's probably not super current. Some of those commands may still work perfectly fine. Others may not, but they are getting better. And the, and the data sets are improving and the efficacy of the work that it's doing is improving. Um, but to answer your question, it's not built off of any one language. It's a, the language model was trained on vast amounts of information to do what chat GPT does. So you can ask it to build something in almost any language you want, if that's what you wanted to try and it will make it for you. And you can even ask it because it's conversational. You can even ask it, Hey, not only write the code, tell me what dependencies I'd have to install first. Give me a step-by-step -step guide on how to actually deploy this code. It will do all of that for you. Hope that helps. Gordon. An issue came in and said, creating audit here, I'll throw up on the screen. Let's see. They said, creating automated troubleshooting and remediation using AI will cause a lot of disruption. Totally agree. Imagine going from solving an incident to providing problem analysis and hardening recommendations. 100%. Like, why not, based off of standard data sets, standards we've all agreed on, let an AI say, if, the, if, you want, if your company wants to train something, then say, reference this data to create recommendations, it should be able to do that for us. Like, it, it, if the, the possibility exists. It's being shown in chat GPT, a company just needs to put together their LLM, train it, and then present to front end so that you can interact with it. But yes, why not do this and let it provide those recommendations? You create the report so humans can discuss that, figure out the budget, who's going to accomplish it, how you're going to do it, when it's going to be done, the right times for the business. Those are all things that an AI isn't really adept at doing. And we really probably shouldn't give it to an AI, but the reviewing of documentation and validating if this plus this, then this, that's exactly what computational systems are for. Like that's what they do better than anything else. Let it do that. The better we train it, the better results we get from it, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be where I'd like to close the loop maybe on some of my code is to add sort of like a, you know, yes or no, this was a good answer <clears throat> or, you know, some feedback or a follow-up. Here's, mm -hmm. here's the information you gave me. <clears throat> automatically follow up with some questions. I like that a lot. So it, it basically leveraging the power of the backend AI to give a, and I don't mean to be, I, hopefully this doesn't come across as demeaning to anybody. I do not intend it to be, but if you're a, a more senior person, let's say someone like you, John, and you're working in an organization and there's some more junior people, this could be a really good opportunity to provide some training to them um, that is basically on the job training where they get to interact with an operational system. When an error comes up, it prompts them and tells them something and they can, they can respond back to it or see what it's telling them. And they're learning along the way. They're not just saying issue command, open ticket, and they're done. They're actually learning as they go, which is a huge help for onboarding new employees and give them a growth path while also accomplishing what a business needs. No, I completely agree, Jeff. Um, it, it, it's going to affect, and, it, and we're one, like you, I like how you frame this, that we're one small aspect of running an enterprise, right? I'm sure there's people in security out there thinking about this. I'm sure there's people in, right, a variety of, of fields that are thinking, hopefully, how can I use this? How could I make some API calls? How could I even maybe even just use the GUI? So it looks like some answers are starting to come back. Oh, good. L let me let me just go into my um, results center. I'm not sure. Let's just see if there's any answers in here uh, from oh, some this of our one. questions. While you're, while you're doing that, Boyard had a really interesting comment I'm going to throw up on the screen. Using chat GPT to help manage the alarm avalanche. Oh, my God. Can you imagine an ops screen with two or three relevant actionable alerts instead of thousands of squelched ones? <laughs> like, dude, you're sp sorry, you are speaking my language right now. Having, you know, bat way back in the day, early 2000s, having like basically Kiwi syslog up on the screen and trying to trying to write search strings to figure out is that is my VPN tunnel coming up among the 10,000 other logs that are coming in this second? I got to see all the Ike and Isocamp things in there to try to figure out is this VPN tunnel coming up? That's what I needed to know what if this thing could just tell you that like just yeah so here here's here's that um explain it like i'm five example which is pretty neat so what i'm using here also to tie in some other technologies it doesn't have to be just routers and switches there are so many apis out there so what i'm pulling is dna centers issues 
and we see that there's a certain device unable to reach DNA center. Again, this is a sandbox. This isn't any customer or Cisco data. This is just a sandbox. And here I say, please analyze the following DNA issue and explain it like I'm five. All right, kiddo, here's the scoop. Cisco DNA Center is trying to talk to a thing called a network device with this name, but it can't seem to reach it. It's kind of like trying to call your friend on the phone, but their phone is turned off for not receiving any signal. Something's stopping the two from being able to talk to each other. We need to figure that out, figure out what that something is so we can fix it and get them talking again. And here's a bunch of other examples with that. Here's a toy car example, for example, right? So pretty neat stuff. Now, did my configuration management go? No. Let's see if we can get this one to work um, now that the um, API is hopefully back. Let's try it. Configuration management. And I really hope the API answers quickly. Yes, it did. Okay, so check this out. Check this out. Now remember, remember, I, I'm going to try to reconnect this. Our prompt in this case, configuration prompt, can, no, configuration management prompt, is your config generator and make this NTP server. So now if I actually go onto this device now, now I can't prove that it wasn't configured ahead of time, but you'll have to trust me on this. Hey, I'm glad the API is back. Show me on good NTP. There is the NTP server. From human intent, using pyts.configure to push the, the that device. That blows my mind. And it, now here, let's do it. Let's do another one, Jeff, now that it. the API is back. So we're going to add one here. Now I have some pre-canned prompts and we're just going to steal one because it, it's sort of important, the question and how we ask it. And I know that these are going to, hopefully <laughs> the API keeps keeps up with us today. <laughs> so what we're going to say is a, is a static route. Okay, so configure. No, an interface, excuse me. Configure interface GI02 with this IP address. Now notice I say it in Cedar notation. And if anyone's configured an interface, you have to use the long form notation. So I'm going to see, I'm going to test the AI to see if it'll give me the right um, corresponding, you know, long form bits and enable the port, right? Because if I, and let me prove to this, if I just show IP in brief, we can see GI02 is down and it doesn't have an IP address. So that's what we're going to try to change with the push of a button and a simple prompt. So let's go to the CLI and watch the job run. And thank you for your patience for everyone watching. Um, the, the API just sort of went flaky for a little while. And guess what? Show IP interface brief. It now has an IP address. Now it didn't seem to know. Sh yeah, it, sh it did know shut it. It just takes a second for it to come up. There so it, it gave it an IP and it came up. Mm -hmm. Just from and, a just just from a human prompt. And this is so just to double down on this. If you wouldn't mind zooming in your screen a little bit on the prompt, if you could zoom in your screen just a tiny little bit. Um, this is for everyone in the chat right now, and anybody catching us on Team Replay. This is the this is the part that is so cool about this and what this can do. There is no iOS XE command typed in here. All John did is say, "Here's the configuration generator. That's what you are." user this is what i want done and gave it the relevant information and this thing called chat gpt the back end and said what do i do in this case and what it came back with was the right commands to actually make this a reality then this put those commands into the device and ran it no commands were issued from this program other than what was given back from chat gpt so really truthfully human intent translated into an actual configuration now for the non-believer let's try and i have a couple use cases which is this is fun i'm glad this is up so now check this next one out yeah definitely break it while you're here because you're probably not getting another chance for the, for the next couple yeah, of hours so that's just do right. it <laughs> so check this one out generate the configuration on ios xe for a static route to the destination this with cedar using interface gi02 at the next stop of this Respond with code only, no notes, no replace. Today, now, save. Going to Actually, our... hey, John, before before you hit config, can you do me a favor and go back to that screen? I want to hone in on something just for a quick sec. For everyone watching, can you explain to them why you put the statement, respond with code only and no notes and no replace? Oh, yes, yes. And there's also something else I want to highlight. And maybe I'll show it in the, in the GUI. Um, let me show, well, so... What I was getting back when I was playing with this, if I don't put the no code or no notes, no replace, sometimes it would give me 
variables to replace. And I don't want that because I need the actual code. I don't want anything with variables in it. And sometimes at the footer, it would come back with notes, note. This is our best attempt. We don't, you know, this is not a Cisco, an official Cisco configuration. This is our best attempt or something. The other thing is I want to highlight, and I'll put this in the code. I'll show you very, very quickly. The payload always comes back wrapped in Markdown. Um, where do I have this code? Uh, you have to maybe take my, here. So the code always comes, you know, when you're writing a readme file in Markdown and you make three ticks and then say console or Python or JSON or whatever. Yes. The payload always, 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 always comes back wrapped in that from ChatGPT. Yes. So one thing I'm doing Pythonically is massaging the answer to strip out those ticks and any JSON yes. and any notes and anything like that. Because all I want is the Cisco command. Right. So now and that's a, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, and just to add on to that. So for anyone watching, everything just John just explained, and I'll just add one additional component of this. When If you haven't used one of these, these AIs previously, or specifically ChatGPT, not only will it do the things John just described, I, like when I've asked it, to write me some code. It always comes back and says, sure, no problem. Here's what here's what this code is gonna do. Here's the code, exactly the way you described. So it's kind of like embedded in the response. And then below, gives me four or five bullet points that say, here are dependencies you're gonna need to overcome. You're gonna need to add these modules or libraries before you can run this code. And so what John, just to say this a different way, what John is doing is as much as possible, telling the AI, hey, I know you're gonna do that. Big thumbs up. I appreciate that you will, but I don't need it. All I need is just the answer that I'm looking for. So because these are conversational in nature, you can just tell it, this is what I want and this is what I don't want. And it will go do that for you. So here, by the way, and I should have maybe here, you see, this is the raw response. You notice how it always comes back in those ticks. So we have to handle that programmatically if we want to use this code. But this is the differentials right here. So you can see it's added NTP server, it's added the IP address of no shutdown, it's added the static route. And now that's a PyETS capability of the differential, but I love this. Here's my question, right? And there's the questions we ask it and there's the code it generated. And we have a history of what was pushed to the device. Now, really, let's do something really far out there. And this one really surprised me that it worked. So I'm gonna delete this and we're gonna say, you are a Cisco code generator. And this one is as about, I don't want to say about as complex as it gets, but it's pretty complex. And someone from the community actually suggested I try this. Hey, John, real quick, before you yeah. can, can uh, Boyard just ask if when you switch back over to your ID, could you maybe, you could take it full screen, but could you maybe zoom in the font a little bit? Because they're having a hard time seeing what you Oh, my doing. VS code? Yeah, oh, your yes. VS code. If you could zoom that in just a tiny little bit. That'd be great. No, great call. Great call. I should have thought of that. It's all good. And I'll do it one more time. That's why we have community members to remind us. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And then am I at the bottom of this? There we go. Okay. Okay. So now, so again, generated for an inside outside NAT using interface this with an inside address of this. And this interface with an IP of that as the outside address and enable the ports, a NAT. Now, some things to make note of. I don't mention anything about an access control list or how to apply this NAT. I'm just asking for that to be done. Now, when I generate this, at least in my history of this, and this should work, I've had pretty good success with this one. If the API is still answering, here's the question. And it might think a couple seconds because it's a pretty complex question. So there we go. Look at, look, look. And there I'm applying it. And then I'm writing it to the database. So look at what it did. It made an access list. It applied the NAT with overload. Like if I do the show run on this device, I know this is hard to see. But if I do the show run, a couple of things have happened. GI02 now has IP NAT inside. GI03 has an IP NAT outside and has been no shut. I have this um, NAT inside source static, NAT source list overload, and an access control list. And I'll just show you the differential real quick. 
refresh this. I should have it at the bottom. So look at everything it generated for me. And then here's all the differentials. So like a full NAT mm -hmm. on an inside outside with some prompts. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you showed that last one. I, I'm blown away by that last one you just showed. But you know, <coughs> I think I think Ivan's comment here really is very resonant. We should definitely address it because Ivan, to your point, you know, John in this demo that he's showing or this uh, this lab environment that he's playing with is showing the possibilities all the way up to and including letting this to letting his program not the ai but his program uh, go through and push the config directly to the device and commit it and there it is to your point not everyone is going to be comfortable letting the letting um, an application do that for them they're going to maybe want tell me what it is and i can go configure it for myself um i think what's really valuable about what john's being able to show here and you're i'm, I'm sure you're seeing this too is that these are the possibilities. The possibility is you can do all of this up to and including letting a program or a tool that you have that is not the AI take that data once it's verified that that is what you want and apply it to a device for you. Would you always want to do that? And may, would some places maybe say there are security concerns, we need that to go through various types of review, we have a change management process or it has to go through a CCD? Absolutely, and all of those are totally valid. I think what, what I find valuable in this is showing that it works. It can be done. Knowing that the huge caveat off to the side here, a huge caveat, is that that data may, always, may not always come back correct. It may be wrong. It may be invalid. It may break a device. All, yes, all of those things are true. But what is possible is that you can do this. this. This whole idea of the art of the possible. This is possible. Doesn't mean you need to do it or want to do it, but it is possible. Exactly. You nailed it, Jeff. Thank you for saying that. And I, I, I repeat what Jeff's saying. Would you want to do this? Could you do this? There are different things. Can you and would you? Or, but maybe at some point in time, it'll cross over and be better. And this would actually be the preferred way of doing it. We don't know yet where this is going to lead, right? Here's something a little more grounded now that the API is answering. And I'll share the screen again. This is another fun little demo that I thought of. And this is maybe a little more grounded in reality. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run show, parse show interface and send it the state of the show interface per interface per device. And I'm going to say your network state analyzer please analyze the following state and tell me if it's okay. Now, as you may know, all the only thing in network state is counters and stuff, right? So there isn't really like some security concern here that I could think of, but let's run the code. And what we're gonna see is it's gonna kick off the PyTS job and we're gonna start parsing the interfaces. So this is the payload per interface that we're sending the, the AI and asking it that human question, does this look okay? Now, I think the AI, AI is starting to, to synthesize the question right now. And we should, if the AI is, if API is still up, start getting some answers back. Come on, is it, it didn't go back down, did it? And we're waiting for that. I, the, the thread that is going on in the chat right now is brilliant. I absolutely love this. Uh, Julian and Kayon and John McCrate are having this wonderful conversation about other ways that this could be used. And this is, to me, this is exactly what we were hoping to accomplish by streaming today is, is just getting, giving all of you an opportunity to have some, like just spark some new interest or interest in a way it's like, Oh wait, I did. I, now I'm, I'm not, I wasn't thinking about this before, but now that makes me think this other thing. Like I love this idea of change management or peer review, having the AI do the peer review before some code goes out. Or do yeah. the code the code review based, give it some structured conditions, say this is exactly what I want you to do and how I want you to do it. Tell me what could go wrong with this based off of other information you have. That's wild. That could that that could even be a thing that can then be reported mm -hmm. onto a group to review. That's yeah, bananas. I think I think right now it's sort of like having the discussion as cave humans, right? How do we use fire? Like we found this thing. What do, do we can cook meat with it? We can burn things with it. We can adhere things with it. Mm -hmm. We can sanitize water. We can boil water. Like that's sort of where we are right now. Is like, yes. what can we possibly do with this newfound artificial intelligence? And I, I know it's very scientific or science fiction like at this point. Um, it, it looks like it's sort of hanging again, Jeff. Unfortunately, that's okay. But the, but the idea with the state interface is that it's relatively safe and sanitized data to send it and what i like I, if it answers we'll see if it comes back or not um it actually rationalizes its answer it's like it's justifying its existence which i i respect in an ai if i could say it yeah. it says 
based on these counters all being zero and based on the interface being up and up, I believe your interface is okay. So it's not like it just says, yes, the interface is okay. It actually says, yes, and here's the rationale behind my answer of mm -hmm. yes, it's okay. So mm -hmm. we, when we read that back, we can almost trust it a little more to say, oh, I see, it looked at all the counters and determined they're all zero. So this interface is healthy and I can give, I can trust that answer, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the trust word, Let's as we're kind of, we got about five minutes left on the show okay. today. And as we're kind of honing on that trust word in security and privacy, because of course that's the, nearly the biggest topic that anybody in our industry, anywhere related to technology is thinking. Uh, Julian just brought this up a second ago in the chat. I need to read, here, I'll put it up on the screen for everyone to see. Um, I need to read open OpenAI's data privacy controls, audit capabilities, et cetera. Orgs are gonna require that we demo prod data can check, can be checked against the API's call. You know, there's a lot of nuance here and you are hundred percent correct, Julian. Absolutely correct. Like I, Cisco and many other vendors are actively working on, or probably working on, I don't have any direct knowledge of this because I'm not part of those parts of Cisco, but working on our own, you know, large language models that can be, you know, you know, secure scrubbed data that we know that is safe for our things to use, that we that we can provide some trust and think confidence to our customers. And I'm sure most companies are working on things of that nature, because why wouldn't you be? Um, and you bring up a valid point that there will be a place to place and time to use something like a, a chat GPT for your production operations at your company in a secure and private setting. There will be times where that's not the thing that you should use and there should be something else to use. 100% agree with that. The great part about this is the capability exists now to do it. Now you get to choose how you want to point that tool at the problems you have, rather than just being hindered by the fact that no tool even exists. So Jeff, that um, the results came back. If you want to share the screen again real quick, yeah, I can you show this just to finish up our there day here with a nice win. So what's mm -hmm. pretty neat is we have our device, the interface, our actual payload that we've sent it, so we can actually you know, cross check this real time. Please analyze the following state. Tell me if it's okay. Based on the interface state provided, everything seems to be okay. Line and protocol and opera status are both up, indicating that it's functioning properly. IPv4 section seems that it has an assigned interface and has connectivity. Counter section indicates that there have been packets transmitted and received with no errors. It indicates that it's a virtual interface, but everything works fine. Overall, it seems like it's working properly. You know, and then some more answers. This is a very similar ideas here. Duplex mode is set to full and the speed is 1000, which is a desired config. Based on this information, it seems it's in a healthy state, right? Similar answer. So I just want to show that that's, that's a pretty, you know, actual real world. Here's counter information, mm -hmm. right? Just start <clears throat> pouring it, a pouring interface data at it and getting basically human type responses back saying, Looks okay to me. Looks good. Looks yeah. doesn't look good, right? We could maybe even follow that up with a second question that just says, give me a your best yes or no answer. And then we could, you know, maybe color it if it says no. Maybe make that cell red. This oh. interface is right. You know what? We should really spend another show. We should really talk a bit about a bit more about the the sort of leadership aspects of this. Because what you're describing right there is something that many people I've heard build and work and try to build in the past where they uh, um, and sorry, my computer might just slow down because out itself, um, as, as it does sometimes, um, is being able to ask a home automation device like, um, you know, Alexa. Oh, no, you stop. <laughs> I woke her up. Um, but Google Home, <laughs> a, Apple, whatever the whatever Siri, whatever yeah. your home your automation tool to be able to ask it. Hey, like I, do, I I use it to turn on my lights here in the shed, my in my my studio here. I use A over here in the corner to turn on my whole system. What you you just described is being able to give almost a voice even more effectively than these, or even leveraging these, because these are AIs. Give it the ability to call into this and say, "Hey, can tell me the tell me an answer that I need to know." So a senior director or a VP could be able to say, "Are we good?" And it could say, "Yes," based off all the information I have right now. This is the state that we're in, and give more than just a up or down response, but actually give a more human sounding response to give that person a bit more confidence. It's a bit of, it's a bit of psychological hacking yet. That's what people, that's what a lot of people need. I need, I need to know that I'm getting something that is not just a technical answer that makes me feel like, yeah, but I don't think that really answers my question. Maybe you didn't understand me. It, the, the people in those positions want to know that 
with some level of confidence, this thing is giving them a response that is more nuanced than just good or bad. And I think that could be a whole other conversation we have, but you know what? We've been on for an hour. I can't believe it's been an hour. That was amazing. John, thank you so much for showing everything. No, thanks and for, um, I want to thank everyone's oh. patience. I know that the API had a little bit of hiccups, but the demo gods overall were pretty good. And I'm glad I was able to show so some, <laughs> some real world results and some real output. So wow, this is... uh, we had a great crowd and great mm -hmm. interaction. Thank you so much for joining, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, and start thinking about your own droids, your own R2-D2s out there, everyone. Yep, absolutely. And everyone, thank you. So, yeah, think of your own droids. How would it look for you? What is it going to look like? I'm going to work on a blog post for this. If you want more content like this, if you want to hear more about AI and things that we can do with it, what the possibilities look like. Um, John and I are going to have been talking about doing some additional streams on this topic. I've been talking with some folks inside Cisco Research, well, a group at Cisco, about the work they've been doing res with responsible AI. So look forward to more sessions coming up in the future. If there's more topics or other topics you want to hear about in live streams, message me directly. You can find me at Jeff Bull Tech on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the socials, TikTok. I'm everywhere. Send me a message. Let me know what other what other topics would you like to have on a stream? And I'm happy to help bring John and others on to bring those things to you. So John, with that said, thank you so much again for being here. Sincerely appreciate it. Community, everyone from John and Boyard and Marie and Julian and everybody else I missed. Thanks for being in the chat. We sincerely appreciate you. Have a wonderful rest of your day and we will see you soon.